Hi, I'm Kathleen Staten, the manager of Music Constructed, and I am so excited to be here tonight with Victoria Rogers. This is a first for Music Constructed, uh, and we, of course, are the music education support system uh, that is part of West Music. Uh, tonight is a very special night because we are hosting our first pre-service teacher. Uh, I met Tori at the Virginia Music Educators Conference um, almost a year ago, I think it was, and she just had so much to share and such a clear voice and vision for music education. And we realized that everybody's an expert where they are uh, in their journey as a teacher and becoming a teacher. And we think it's really important that people have a chance to present, to talk, to connect, uh, and that those new teachers out there, those of you with us tonight, have that chance to connect with teachers who, like you, are finding their feet and have great ideas that can help change the landscape of music education in our country. So with that, I introduce to you, Tori Rogers. Thanks for being here tonight, Tori. Yes, thank you. I'm very, very excited to be here um, and to share everything that I've learned um, throughout my experience with music. Let me just, uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Got a little slideshow. Um, all right, is everything everything good with the slideshow? Okay. It looks good. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So today we're going to be talking about vocal independence, especially with elementary students, fourth and fifth grade around that age, um, some early middle schoolers, specifically when it comes to their opinions of their own voice and their musical agency. Um, it says under their society says that they can't, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But first, I want to talk about my uh, I technological difficulties. <laughs> I want to talk about myself um, just so you guys can understand a little bit about who I am. I have uh, been in the music field for about 15 years. I started when I was in the third grade in an elementary general music class, just like everybody else. Um, my first memory was of a Christmas pageant that we did back then. It was it was extremely fun, and I've been doing it ever since. I am in my senior year right now at the University of Lynchburg. Very proud to be here, proud to start student teaching in the spring, very excited, very nervous. I'm also a multi-instrumentalist, um, but my primary focus is vocal, and that's what I've been doing uh, for the full 15 years. The instrument started a little bit later than that. <laughs> so why exactly are we talking about this? Well, when I was in elementary school, I had a choral voice. And I still have a choral voice, but thankfully through college, I've gotten to experience some of the more Broadway voices and pop voices and learning how to work in the classical genre. Uh, but just because I had been in choir for my entire life, I had developed that sound. Unfortunately, certain people didn't really like that very much, um, especially my mother, <laughs> who decided that vibrato wasn't good. Um, and after a while, uh, I realized society really does dictate um, what students think about themselves, especially parents and peers and us as teachers. We have to be considerate of students' opinions and feelings, but we also need to be cognizant that they don't necessarily understand the different levels, and especially at an elementary school, the amount of training that it takes and the knowledge that it takes to be able to do the different genres of music. And that's actually what we're gonna be talking about today. So starting off, general basis, the social learning theory. Now, social learning theory uh, was started by Albert Bandura. He was a psychologist. He actually passed away in 2021, but he's most known for the Bobo doll experiment, as well as his thoughts on self-efficacy and the social learning theory. What part of the social learning theory uh, is most important? Because it's a big one. In this sort of scenario, we're gonna be talking mostly about mimicry. Now, Albert Bandura postulated that mimicry happens in children because they want to impress their elders. They want to impress the people who they see as not necessarily above them, but who they want respect from. And so if that person does something, then that must be the correct way. And so children learn through that. And what happens is that gives them the purpose, that gives them the drive to push forward because they know that if they do something that's correct or copy someone else, then that purpose is fulfilled, that person is happy, and that means that they succeeded. 
So I was actually at that VMEA conference that uh, Kathleen was talking about. And one of the speakers said something that really stuck with me. And that's this quote right here. The portion of the brain that allows us to make music is extremely close to the portion that tells us we're naked. Now, in her explanation, she was talking about how if you ask a student to get up and sing, you're basically asking them to get up and strip naked. And obviously, we don't want to do that ever. Never want to do that. And so we have to understand that the, vo the, the voice, um, and I may be a little biased, I'm sorry, but the voice is one of the most important instruments when it comes to self-esteem because it's a part of us. And if we're criticized for singing the wrong way or a different way that someone's not used to, then we take that to heart because it's us. And that's a very difficult thing to change. You can always take an instrument to a shop to get it fixed, or you can change the reed in a clarinet, but you can't necessarily take someone's vocal cords out, tune them up a little bit and put them back. And what does that lead to? That leads to vulnerability. And students, especially fourth and fifth grade students, early sixth grade students, are already in that development stage of their life where they're prone to being extremely vulnerable anyways. They're changing, they're having new experiences, they're switching from middle school, elementary school to middle school. And we need to be wary that students actually look to us for guidance, which goes back to that social learning theory. So we all know that if, uh, if you come into a classroom with a negative attitude, then most likely your students are gonna act out, they're gonna wanna have attention, they're probably not gonna be on their best behavior that day. So when it comes to that authority figure, we have to notice that the negative reactions from us lead to them creating a fixed mindset. Now, elementary students are probably one of the most open groups of individuals you can ever meet. But if you constantly come in and say, oh, opera is terrible, like I can't stand listening to opera, it's horrible, that's gonna then move on to them via the social learning theory. They're gonna copy your actions, copy your decisions, and they're gonna put that fixed mindset of, oh, opera's bad, I shouldn't like it. Why do I sound, like if I sing opera, I'm not gonna be a good singer. Whereas positive mindsets, that gives them that open, that open mindset. If you're positive about everything, like, oh my gosh, I really love that new Cardi B song that's out or that new like Disney movie, it sounds so great. The soundtrack is awesome then that student's gonna be more open to experiencing those. And we see that a lot with multicultural education and talking about sharing music from different countries and making sure that they don't laugh at it or they don't react poorly at it because we want them to understand that that's a different culture and they have different experiences. And so obviously it's going to sound different from us and our music um, or their music even. Uh, so creating that positive environment Whereas if you have a neutral, which a lot of people don't necessarily think of the neutral because we're so focused on the positive, but that neutral allows them to be more individualistic and have that musical agency where they may be wary of something because they can't grasp whether or not you approve of their actions with it or not, but they're still willing to experience it. So why did I say society says they can't? Well, music happens everywhere. It's in the classroom, it's out of the classroom, you can see the family dancing right there. It's in the cars, it's in the grocery stores. It's one of the first things that many children experience because of the fact that it's permeated through society. Uh, it's an integral part of many cultures, if not all cultures across the globe. And it's just something that brings communities together which then causes an issue because communities like to choose their favorites, like pop and rock and country and Disney in their family life. Whereas in the classroom, you may be the classical person or the opera person or the jazz person. That's where they're gonna get that experience, obviously, unless their family loves those things. But you're more likely to see those inside of the classroom, especially with the fact that most pre-service teachers are taught following the classical methods. Uh, they, that's what we're exposed to. That's how we learn, at least from a, a vocal performance standpoint. Now, the problem with this becomes that these students don't necessarily grasp that 
there is any way to sing other than sounding like Ariana Grande or sounding like, I'm trying to think of someone else, uh, Miranda Lambert or Jason Aldean or any of those people because that's who they hear. That's who their parents tell them is good. That's who they see in the classroom. And I know that in the elementary field, we have to focus on making sure that they can relate to our voices. So limiting that vibrato and doing uh, pentatonic scales versus wide ranges of notes. But it's still important that those students understand exactly the, the things that go into it. But they also need to understand that while it is difficult, they are still good where they are now. And that's the main, the main concern here. So to, society dictates self-esteem. We've already established this. We know um, we have all those middle school girls who tell you that your outfit's not good enough. <laughs> uh, so we, we know, especially during this, this time period. And it's, it's complicated because of the fact that you're a teacher and you want to help your students, but you can't do that outside of the classroom. And you may be able to help them form their own identities, but you can't go to a parent and say, let them sing an opera song in the car. Like they want to, they sound good. You may not think so because you don't exactly have that in your top 10. It's not on your Spotify playlists, but it's still good. And as someone who had to work through understanding that my voice as it stands, while yes, training always helps, uh, was not what I would consider to be the greatest thing in the world. It's something that a lot of people did value about me. Um, and I had to come to grips with the fact that I needed to learn versus just do. And that came from the fact that in elementary school, I didn't have that background of here's all of the different experiences you can have for Disney music. You need to limit your vibrato in the modern. If it's older, then you need to increase the vibrato. With pop music, you have to use more of a, uh, a chest resonance, for lack of a better term, versus that head voice that you would see in choir, the open vowels. Uh, and truly understanding that my that my voice is good where it is. And as someone who, while I may not have started student teaching yet, I've been in the elementary classroom. I've seen teachers who just explain a genre, specifically jazz, uh, and they don't teach students how to do it. Uh, they would play, there's a song, um, it's the scat song, and they play that song and the kids sing along, but they don't use any technique whatsoever. And while that is a great way to, ex to show students that genre, it's not necessarily teaching them that that genre is good. How it's would you connect that, uh, Tori, um, if you were going to share jazz in a way that would uh, overcome that barrier of um, explaining the jazz and connecting it to the students? Yeah, so... Essentially, explaining to students the the techniques and ne not necessarily repeating the same song over and over again. Actually, I mean, if it's possible, finding someone out there who can do jazz, finding someone out there who can sing, getting that representative uh, in order to have another authority figure for those students to look up to, playing back into that social learning theory, or even just if you can't find someone taking the time to pause and say, listen, we're not singing jazz right now. Like we are singing the genre, but we need to work at it. There's always more to learn, more to do and explaining to the students that if that's something they're interested in and that they want to do, then they have to take the time to study it. And it doesn't just come naturally, especially in an elementary setting where they're learning to have that more choral-esque elementary student sound. 
uh, being that community where it's versus the one voice. Um, so uh, that actually goes to my next slide right here of answers of things. I do think that having that cultural representative, having that genre representative, if you will, is imperative. And I understand that's not something that everyone can do uh, because of situations uh, outside of our control, <laughs> money, uh, <laughs> various different things that we have to contend with. Uh, but having lesson plans in mind that center around the full picture and not just that partial picture of, oh, I need to fulfill this SOL uh, or I need to fulfill this standard that my my school puts forth and even if you don't have that mindset you probably just want to get through it all um, at least in in the experience I've had with current elementary school teachers because of the fact that there's just so much curriculum it's hard for them to balance everything um, and prioritizing the students opinions of themselves at least I feel is one of the most important things that a teacher can do, especially leading them into middle school. Um, and that also would help with students who don't necessarily understand that they can do music in the choral setting. For the reverse, you have students who think, oh, my voice sounds poppy. I can't sing Whither Must I Wander because it comes out sounding like pink is singing it and that's not what we want in a choir classroom we want that uppity snobby like soprano better than everyone else sound and trust me i've met those people uh, <laughs> and it helps students especially if we start in elementary school know that this field is open to everyone music isn't specific especially in the public school setting that's it's not specific to choir it's not specific to band it's specific to learning music, and that is it. And music is such a wide field that we have to be cognizant that all of these things are out there and take the time to explain that to our students. I had a, a student once ask me how exactly I sang along with one of their piano pieces. I teach piano. Um, at the school here with the elementary school students. And she asked me to sing with her while she was playing. And she was like, how did you do that? How, how did, it sounded like you were being really quiet, but also you were loud at the same time and full of, it, it, I just, I don't get it. And so I took the time and I explained, I was like, listen, like I, have been in choir for my entire life and I know how to blend and my voice just naturally tries to blend even if there's nobody around. <laughs> I'm still working on it much like you're still working on piano but understanding that if you provide them with that area then they the questions will come. The questions and that see that, that need to learn will will happen because they see that that's something you want to do and that you're interested in and they want to be interested in it too, going back to the social learning theory. Uh, yeah, I love how you made that bridge. I think that is what it's all about, right? It, it's about put, giving them something to, to mimic, to copy. Mm -hmm to gain that uh, approval with. Um, and, and that's when, when you get that, that mimicry yep. and repetition. Yeah. It's, repetition is one of the primary things that we learn in so ever since my freshman year of college, having that repetition, because of the short attention spans, repetition is necessary. And it's also something that we have to prioritize in that you have to know what to repeat. And so having that scaffolded learning of, okay, we can show them this scatting song one day, and then the next day try to explain to them how to do it. And then the next day we listen to what their ideas are and see if they have any things that they can come up with. And it's honestly, it's, it's wide open. 
uh, depending on your classroom. And I, I'm very excited <laughs> to see just how many of my, of my future students continue in the music field because of the fact that I plan on explaining to them the differences. And even at the high school level, because I do plan on teaching high school choir, but having them realize if you want to sound like Lady Gaga, you can, you just have to work at it. It's like the voice actors who do the different SpongeBob and Doofenshmirtz and all of those people, they have to take the time to make their voice sound like that. And, and you do too. Uh, so just because, like Kathleen said, I am a pre-service teacher. I haven't exactly been in the field yet. I did have um, some questions that are going to be going out along with this video for people who want to respond uh, via email or any of that. My information will be sent along um, by, by, by Kathleen. But just some basic general ideas of anyone who has experienced this themselves, not necessarily their students as as a, as a singer or a musician, if anyone has experienced it on their own personal level and how that made them, them feel, but also the students as well, have any, have any students that, um, that have been had experienced that and that you've seen in the classrooms? I think students come into classrooms with a, a very preconceived notion of what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to sound, and also what's going to be taught. And so that, you know, one of the really important reasons for having this session at the beginning of the year is mm -hmm. allowing um, the teachers to, to, you know, stop for a second and uh, ask themselves, what kinds of music are they presenting to their students? And then how are they presenting those kinds of music to their students? So, you know, so much too of being in the classroom is meeting the students where they are. Mm -hmm. So great if you're exposing them to scat and to jazz and great if you're exposing them to the blues and country music um, and other cultural musical traditions. But at the end of the day, I think that the key is that one, what do you want to achieve with that? You know, how are they shaping their voices? How are they, they're growing their pitch centers and things like that. Um, and then two, why do they care? Mm -hmm. That that sort of sort of correlating jazz and its context to the students and where they are, I think is as much a part of it as understanding that they can do it. Exactly. Uh, here are the skills to do it. And here's why these people did that and mm -hmm. all of those things. Obviously, you, it's tougher to scaffold that down to the little kids. Um, but uh, if, if it was the little kids, you know, then it's fun to substitute um, syllables for words. You can do it in speech. You can do it in singing. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can relate to that. But I also wanted to ask you to unpack a little bit more, too, about the about that gender norms idea. And if you had thoughts about what, what do you think? think that the impact of um, of society today has on students as they're forming their ideas about their voice and themselves. And I really liked how you put that at the beginning of the session, that the voice is you. It's not yeah. of, it is you. So how do you think that uh, plays into this whole discussion? There is an inherent part of you that wants to despite the social learning theory, be who you are. And obviously developmental things like social learning theory happen at that age where students just, they want to copy. But if there's a student who knows deep down in their heart that they don't fit what society wants them to be, such as individuals who are non-gender conforming, non-binary individuals, trans individuals, and yes, those some happen at the other, but there are students who know that in, in fourth and fifth grade. I had a friend who actually knew even back when it wasn't necessarily considered um, a big thing for students to talk about because it was so shunned back then. It It's difficult because they're having to balance changing their voice already to fit who they are as a person and knowing whether if they want to be 
a more feminine presenting individual, the society expectation of raising the voice or a masculine presenting individual lowering the voice, they already have to balance that. But then adding music on top of that is something that can cause students even more stress and even more anxiety because they're already, they already understand that society doesn't see them how they know they are. But then adding in society doesn't see me as a singer who can actually sing, even though I love music and I love to be able to put that into the ether and put it out there and express myself in that way. I can't be who I am and still sing the way I want to. So you have on one hand, the student who identifies as their, as their sex uh, or their gender assigned at birth. And they have that pressure of fitting into the vocal styles, fitting into what society likes. But then you have the double standard of the students who know society does not consider what they feel in their heart to be true plus the fact that society says already says that and honestly it sounds trivial at that point that they don't even they don't fit in their body but additionally they don't fit in their heart as well with their voice and that completely obliterates any sense of self especially for singers because as I said the voice is you and if you can't sing or talk or express yourself it just puts a, a damper on on everything else and if you if you love something so much but you can't do it you're going to stop doing it eventually you're going to grow to hate it most likely and that's not what we want <laughs> in the classroom or out of the classroom because music yeah. is so important yeah i think you bring up some really good points about that about that not liking yourself when you're trying to be somebody else or sound like somebody else and whether that's gender or non-conforming gender um ideas of how you're supposed to sound or if it's you're imitating an artist or or whatever mm -hmm. that is or if you're being told that no you're meant to sing high or no you aren't a good singer um that the impact of those things is deep and profound um and 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 really what we're meant to be doing is is meeting them where they are and, exactly and investing in in building them up so that they can continue to participate and learn and grow in music and in their in in their own in their own bodies and in their own space exactly and it's also important to consider the parent aspect um because you're not the only authority figure and if they're going home and hearing all of these negative Things. We already know that it's it's hard for students to come to school and it be a safe safe space and then go home and it be a not so safe space. Um, but having those parents and those those peers that push them out because of the fact that they sound different or they aren't who they're expected to be. Um, so I know that. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I was one of those kids because I'm still here <laughs> and still musicking. Uh, but I had several friends who were in, in that situation. And so I was also wondering um, if anyone out there who's listening to this uh, had anyone who left their program because their parents or their peers pressured them out of it. And understanding that it's because of those preconceptions and those those prioritizations of the different the different genres that that, that child may not uh, may not be a part of at that given moment. But it's it's a huge issue that starting off with the changing of the lesson plans, the integrating that more specific detail might begin to fix especially if you have a student who feels that your classroom is a safe space because that makes them trust you even more. Um, but if you have a kid who already has that low self-esteem going into middle school or going into the choral or and music field, it's the way that it is now just most likely going to get worse unless they learn from the get-go that they can change. 
I wasn't familiar with um, Bandura's work on this, but it sure sounds like looking through this lens at vocal development, mimicry, and self-esteem is really a, um, addressing an issue that's at, at the foundation of everything that's happening in music education these days. It's understanding that students are more connected to you than you realize is very important, especially with the younger students. Uh, we may think, oh, they're just here to go to the playground, you know, and they they'll learn, they'll they'll pass the the tests at the end of the year. They'll they'll know what two plus two is by the time they leave first grade. They can read Dr. Seuss and all of those things. They can sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but knowing why they do those things really shines a light on just how important education is and music is in in general in in life as a whole because of the fact that it's integrated into our society so much you can't go anywhere without hearing it or honestly thinking it if you're anything like me you get that song stuck in your head for for hours and hours and it never leaves <laughs> and while that is an amazing thing, it also can feel very separate and can it can make you feel as if you're not a part of society's expectations, especially if you like things that no one else likes, like, I don't know, heavy metal is an example. That's one that a lot of people despise, but the people who love it, love it, or there wouldn't be mosh pits. Um, <laughs> So it's being open to understanding that you have to take the time and you have to know that they respect you, even if they themselves don't understand that they respect you. Yeah, well, Tori, I think you're well on your way to setting a foundation of really considering your students first uh, mm -hmm. and then the the learning second which um is part of that change i think that is happening already and is trying to become purposefully a part of the music education experience for children across our country thank you yeah i really i really try <laughs> i try yeah, you, I mean, you're at this perfect point, too, where you can, this is a time you've got to keep these ideals and get these ideas and then hold hold true to them throughout your career. You know, uh, going to different conventions across the country, it's mm -hmm. inspiring to hear uh, that wonderful, passionate idealism of the things that we can do to change what music education is to these students, to their parents, to the communities, and how we can really and truly leverage music uh, to help develop strong, confident people. Well, it's just identifying that everyone has to start somewhere. And we were all at that spot. And identifying who exactly we needed or had that really brought us to be where we are today in this position of loving music and leaving music. Because these students are our legacy and we want them to be the best that they can be in any sort of aspect of our philosophies. And how do we do that? It's making sure that they are our focus and that they as people are what we understand. And I, I use understand very lightly because we're never going to understand the mind of a 10 year old <laughs> even when we were 10 year olds we didn't understand the minds of 10 year olds <laughs> exactly right yeah yeah but I think if, if we're going in with this idea of how to, how to approach their education and that it's the education of becoming a person through music and not just attaining musical skill or a perfect pitch or being able to do solfege <laughs> yes <laughs> Just kind of like stat to bring things full circle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Gotta connect the syllables that go with making music. <laughs> Well, Tori, this has been so informative and, and such a wonderful look into what you're learning as a student and also um, your own goals and aspirations for how to implement it in a classroom situation. I'm just really grateful that you were willing to come and to talk with us tonight. I'm grateful for the offer to do so. This is probably one of 
the things I, I've always I've always wanted to get up and talk at conferences. I like I like public speaking a lot. So sharing sharing things that I've learned is something that I have always been excited about. So I'm very I'm very glad to have met you and to have learned about music constructed at the conference. Um, and very glad that after almost a year, <laughs> we finally we finally made it happen. So. <laughs> yes, uh, after a year we did, but it takes that much time to get those ideas to come to fruition uh, and put all the plans in place. And of course, all the hard work and research that you had to do to be ready to, to present on this. Well, we look forward to having you back on our platform and hope to see you at music education conferences across the country in the future. Yes, I look forward as well. Thank you so much.